overnight NY News. The Philippines becomes the top 20 country worst hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. Several senators appeal to banks and mobile money services to suspend the online fees for digital transactions while the country continues to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. Internet cafes are warned that if they get caught accepting minors inside their establishments when classes begin next week, they will face complaints for violating city ordinances and the IATF guidelines. Senator Ronald Bato de la Rosa seeks probe on alleged censorship of Facebook. U.S. President Donald Trump and First Lady Melania test positive for COVID-19. California becomes the first U.S. state to pass a law establishing a task force to study and make recommendations on reparations for Black Americans. Good evening, Philippines and the world. Today is Friday, October 2, 2020. I am William Theo. Join us in the next hour as we deliver today's top stories around the country and in other parts of the world. I'm Angelo Castro III. We are also seen in 1,935 satellite monitoring centers nationwide and via live streaming worldwide with the UNTV News and Rescue social media accounts and our website, untvweb.com. I am William Theo. First in the news, President Rodrigo Duterte will not visit Boracay Island for now, according to Palace. That is possible in the future, though. Our Malacayang correspondent, Rosan Nicoz, tells us why. Because of his hectic schedule in Malacadiang, President Rodrigo Duterte is not expected to visit the Boracay Island soon. Yesterday, only 35 tourists visited a popular tourist destination on the first day of its opening for people coming from general community quarantine areas. One possible reason for this is the cost of a swab test, which is a requirement before entering the island. A tourist must have a confirmation booking with a hotel on Boracay accredited by the Department of Tourism. An airline ticket and a negative RT-PCR test result for COVID-19 taken two or three days before the travel date. According to Presidential Spokesperson Harry Roque, though it is abnormal times, he is sure President Rodrigo Duterte would love to visit Boracay as well. However, he is busy in Malacanang and a visit to Boracay in the near future may not happen. But the palace official is not discounting the possibility of that Boracay trip because it is also important to encourage people to support the tourism industry. Secretary Roque will fly to Boracay on Monday and conduct his press briefing there. Rosa Licos, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. The trial on Russia's vaccine, Sputnik, is supposed to begin this month, but it hasn't. Here's Aiko Miguel to explain why. The Philippines is still waiting for the clinical protocol of Russia's vaccine Sputnik. The DOH is waiting for vaccine manufacturer Gamaleya Research Institute's response for the clinical trial to start. It's supposed to begin this month based on what the DOH said in previous weeks. But according to the DOH, the process should be complete before starting the trial. Na evaluate na initially ng ating mga vaccine expert panel yung kanilang mga uh, official documents. Uh, and then uh, we have sent for additional request para sa iba pang mga mga detalye uh, base sa pag-aaral na ginawa ng vaccine expert panel. So hanggang sa ngayon inaantay pa rin natin ang kasagutan ng ating uh, ng ano ng Russian government no, yung Gamaleya Institute. We also were requesting then yung kanilang protocol no, for the clinical trial that will be done here in the country para ma-evaluate na natin para pag nag-apply na sila, mas mabilis na yun. Meanwhile, according to DOH Undersecretary Maria Rosario Vergere, experts are still evaluating all potential herbal drugs and treatments against COVID-19, including Tawa-Tawa, Japanese anti-flu drug Avigan, Lagundi, and Virgin Coconut Oil or VCO. Ang Tawa-Tawa, inaantay pa rin natin yung regulatory approval 
yun pong uh, abigan. Uh, tapos na po, uh, napirmahan na po actually, no, yung clinical trial agreement. Inaantay na lang po natin yung ibang kailangan pang maisagawa para maumpisahan na natin ito. Yun pong sa Lagundi, they are still currently screening and enrolling uh, patients or individuals who will be included into this trial. For the virgin coconut oil, yun pong para sa suspects and probable cases, ito po ay still ongoing and they would want to expand. No? Uh, ito po ay pinag-aaralan at pinag-uusapan. Uh, itong expansion na to ay yung pagbibigay ng VCO para sa mga nasa ospital naman. The Philippines is also waiting for the World Health Organization's announcement this October. WHO is set to choose which of the 34 potential COVID-19 vaccines will be included in the Solidarity Trial. At the end of October, the Solidarity Trial for potential vaccines is scheduled to begin. But this might change depending on WHO's decision. Last week, the country's Food and Drug Administration said the best-case scenario for the approval of COVID-19 vaccine in the country may come April next year. Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Several senators are appealing to banks and mobile money services to suspend the online fees for digital transactions while the country is still dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. The central bank announced yesterday that at least 31 banks have extended the waiving of fees for Instapay and Pesonet transactions until December 31, 2020. These include Sabuan Aluilia Rural Bank, Land Bank of the Philippines, Metro Bank, Philippine National Bank, RCBC, and Security Bank. While e-money issuers GCash and PayMaya will be free of charge until October 31. However, for Senator Aini Marcos, the period of the suspension is too short. According to the lady senator, who also chairs the Senate Committee on Economic Affairs, banks and financial technology companies should have extended the suspension of online transfer fees until the first half of next year when a COVID-19 vaccine is expected to be available. Senator Marcus says this will give support to Filipinos who lost their jobs due to the pandemic and are now venturing into online business. Earlier, Senate Committee and Finance Chair Senator Sonny Angara also appealed to banks and mobile money services to suspend the collection of fees for digital transactions while the country is still in the middle of the pandemic. Angara says this will help every family during this very challenging time. He also expressed support to the efforts of the country's central bank to promote the use of digital transactions to reduce physical or cash transactions. And for Senator Kiko Pangilinan, Banco Central ng Pilipinas should step in to suspend or slash the online transaction fees during this health emergency. Meanwhile, the Philippines becomes the top 20 country worst hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. Our health correspondent, Aiko Miguel, tells us why. Based on yesterday's coronavirus case count, the Philippines had the 20th largest caseload among countries hit by the pandemic. We had 314,079 total confirmed cases yesterday, October 1. Just a few hundreds below Italy's 314,861 cases. We even overtook Pakistan's 312,086 cases. According to the Department of Health, the National Capital Region remains as the epicenter of coronavirus disease 2019 in the Philippines. Despite this report, the DOH stands firm that the country's health system is keeping up with the government's COVID-19 response compared in the previous months. We might be in the top 20 among all of the countries in the world with the number of cases, but when we look at our health system capacity, it has improved tremendously. No? Nakita natin noon na talagang hirap na hirap tayo no? just to accommodate patients dito sa ating mga ospital. Umabot tayo doon sa time na talagang kailangan na nagaantay ang mga pasyente sa labas ng ospital, hindi nakakarating sa ospital. Even the country's contact tracing efforts have been more efficient through the works of local governments. Pag tinignan natin ang contact tracing efforts natin ngayon, mas efficient tayo because ngayon, yung mga tinitrace natin na contacts, meron tayong sinasabing dapat within 24 hours, na-trace mo na yung contact mo. And within 2, 48 hours, kompleto na 100% lahat ng na-contact. At nakikita natin, ano, 
na nag um, na achieve na ng mga LGUs natin itong sinasagawang uh, target na ito for contact tracing. The DOH also reiterates that the Philippines should not be compared with other countries because the system, structure, political, and social environments vary in each country. According to Undersecretary Vergere, independent bodies should also look at the Philippines' recovery rate, which is now at 80%, and less than 2% case fatality rate compared with the cumulative cases. So it is not really just the numbers. We have to look at the other variables. We have to focus on the active cases and not the cumulative number of cases. So whatever uh, would be this ranking uh, um, across the globe, this is because of the totality of the number of cases. But when we look at the number of active cases, our recovery rate, our case fatality rate, and looking at our health system capacity, we can see that we are we have improved and sa tingin natin nakakaagapay tayo dito sa ating response for COVID-19. The DOH says it is committed to finding more ways to prevent COVID-19 transmission in the country. The government is also considering the strategies used by other countries in responding to the health crisis, which could be feasible and effective in the Philippines. The DOH adds, what's important is for medical frontliners to take a breather and preventing hospitals from reaching full capacity. Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Meanwhile, today, the Philippines remains in the top 20 among countries worst hit by the coronavirus pandemic. Today, the country's Department of Health report reported 2,611 new cases, raising the total confirmed cases of coronavirus infection in the Philippines to 316,678. We're a place below Italy with 317,409 as of today and one notch above Pakistan with over 313,000. Meanwhile, the National Capital Region, which remains to be the epicenter of the disease in the country, reported the highest number of cases with more than 1,000, followed by Cavite with 202 additional patients. We have lost 56 more patients. But through our fervent prayers, medical interventions, and sacrifices of our medical frontliners, 416 more people have won their battle against the invisible enemy. That brings the total recoveries nationwide to 254,617. Thanks be to God. Let's now take a closer look at the updated count of coronavirus cases around the world. The COVID-19 pandemic has now reached a total of more than 34.3 million confirmed cases in 188 countries, regions, and sovereignty. That's after more than 237,000 new cases were recorded in various countries since yesterday. The fast-spreading disease has so far claimed over 1 million lives, with over 5,000 new deaths globally. While almost 24 million patients across the globe have recovered from the new coronavirus infection. Thanks be to God. A consumers group questions the need for a maintaining balance in beep cards used on EDSA busway. It also calls for the suspension of the no beep card, no ride policy. Joe Anano tells us why. Following backlashes on the pilot implementation of the no-beep card, no-ride policy on EDSA busway, Consumers Welfare Advocacy Group Laban Consumer is urging the government to suspend the implementation of the policy until the end of this year. The group adds that using beep cards should be optional for passengers who cannot afford to pay the 180 pesos initial worth of a beep card. Laban Consumer President Vic Dimagiba argues that the Department of Transportation should clarify first the policies, particularly the issue of maintaining balance. The group asked why beep card use on EDSA busway has a maintaining balance before a passenger could board a bus, while beep cards used on MRT and LRT do not require any. Yung po kasing sinasabi na kailangan may remaining balance na 65 pesos, uh, that's a new policy ah, kasi ako po ay sumasakay din ng MRT before COVID-19. Actually, kahit na negative ka na eh, basta makukumpleto mo yung, yung ride mo, say Makati to Quezon Avenue, negative ka na, papapasukin ka pa din eh. Sa susunod mong load, ididak lang yung kumbaga may utang ka. Ang pinakamalaga po, ipag-aralan po nila yung mga 
class ng consumer na gagamit po ng BIP card sa mga buses. But AF Payments Incorporated, the company behind Tap and Go Payment System BIP card for its part say that they have no income from the 80 peso BIP card itself. The company explains that the need for the maintaining balance is to prevent bus operators from incurring losses. Imagine this scenario, ha, na if we do not do that, uh, and ang pasahero uh, pays for the lowest fare, right? Like, ilan, uh, itatap niya lang is 10 pesos. And then at the end, he took the farthest fare. Malulugi naman po ang operators. Meanwhile, the Department of Transportation clarifies that beep cards and beep rides are not the same. Beep is the interoperable card being used in EDSA Busway, MRT, and LRT, while beep rides are used on modern jeepneys. In a statement, the DOTR explains that the operator of a public utility vehicle has the prerogative to choose which automated fare collection system provider they will choose and not the DOTR. The DOTR further adds that negotiations with AF Payments Incorporated on waiving the 80 peso initial value of a beep card are underway. Joan Nano, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. Aside from giving uh, the beep, beep cards for free to EDSA Busway Commuters, Transportation Secretary Arthur Tagade also wants the 5 peso convenience fee in loading beep cards to be removed. During the Senate hearing on the proposed 2021 budget of the agency, Togada told senators that he has ordered the scrapping of the convenience fee. The secretary adds they are now in talks with the service provider to also remove the supposed minimum load requirement for beep cards. The DOTR also noted that they are now looking into online loading and paying fares using smartphones and QR codes. A lawmaker who's an ally of House Speaker Alan Peter Cayetano assures that the House will be able to finish the budget, the budget deliberation before the session breaks despite the speakership row. Ray Pelayo tells us why. The House of Representatives resumed its deliberation on the 4.5 trillion peso proposed national budget for 2021. It was suspended last Wednesday when Speaker Alan Peter Cayetano offered his resignation which was rejected by majority of the representatives. Anakalasugan Party List Representative Mike Defensor assures that they will be able to finish the deliberation before the Congress session's break on October 17. They are hoping that the budget would be signed by the President before the year ends. Questions are now floating if the change of leadership dated October 14 will push through. Marinduque Representative Alan J. Velasco's camp has said that it will proceed. But the pensor said what happened on Wednesday just showed the support of the majority to the Cayetano's leadership. The motion to make the speakership vacant should be done by Velasco's allies, but the pensor will immediately object it, he said. Bayan Muna Representative Carlos Salate smells matters concerning the 2022 elections in the ongoing issue in the House. Ang nakikita rin po natin dito ay banggaan ito sa kontrol ng resources, hindi lang dito sa House of Representatives, kundi ang buong budget na nakasalalay ngayon at uh, pinagdidibatihan dito sa Kongreso. Uh, dahil nga uh, kailangan uh, makontrol ito. Uh, kung sino ang nakaupong speaker ay may kontrol nito, lalong-lalo na pagdating sa 2022 election. Laguna Representative and Deputy Speaker Dan Fernandez said that the Congress has the right to choose their own leader and they are not bound to the term sharing agreement. Ray Pelayo, UNTV News and Rescue, we serve the people, we give glory to God. A lawmaker is seeking to investigate the alleged censorship of social media giant Facebook. Senator Ronald De La Rosa filed resolution number 531 seeking for a Senate probe on FB's taking down of accounts and pages supportive of the administration and the campaign against terrorism and communist insurgency. According to the senator, it affects not only the country's peace and order and security, but the Filipinos' freedom of expression. He adds that there is a need for an inquiry to ensure the protection and non-curtailment of freedom of speech and expression as guaranteed in the Constitution. 
Earlier, President Rodrigo Duterte called out Facebook after it took down networks of fake accounts and pages allegedly linked to the Philippine military and police due to coordinated inauthentic behavior which is a violation of the social media platform's policy. The Philippine Statistics Authority encourages the voluntary registration for national ID system commencing on October 12. The PCA, PSA, however, prioritizes 5 million lowest income family heads in the registration. Asher Kadapan Jr. explains why. After several postponements, the Philippine Statistics Authority, or PSA, will officially start the registration for the Philippine Identification System, or PhilSys, on October 12. Known as the National ID System, it aims to provide primary proof of identification to every Filipino citizen. In an interview, PSA Assistant Secretary Rosalinda Bautista explained that the registration is voluntary, but they encourage all Filipinos to register as government transactions will soon require every want to present a national ID. The PSA will initially prioritize the registration of 5 million household heads included in the lowest family income and expenditure survey listed with the Department of Social Welfare and Development. This will help the government immediately aid Filipinos who are in need. PSA personnel will conduct house-to-house -house visits to the low-income families in 32 provinces with a low number of COVID-19 cases. The head of the family will undergo pre-registration for a more convenient process when they go to the registration centers in their respective municipalities on November 25. As part of the second step, pre-registrants will need to fill out forms and have their biometrics captured in the registration center. The third and last step will be the release of the national ID. Those who would like to register for national ID need to have an original copy of any of the required proof of identification, which may be birth certificate from PSA and a government-issued ID, passport, unified multi-purpose identification or UMID from GSIS or SSS, or driver's license from Land Transportation Office. The PSA also targets to pre-register additional 4 million individuals before the year ends, while for next year, the target is to register 40 million more and then 42 million in 2022. Asher Kadapan Jr., UNTV News & Rescue, we serve the people, we give glory to God. Authorities assure that dolomite sand in Manila Bay will bring no harmful effects on humans and the environment. But for marine experts from the University of the Philippines, dumping artificial white sand is not the solution to the problems in Manila Bay. Vincent Arboleda will tell us why. The Environmental Management Bureau and the Mines and Geosciences Bureau conducted four different tests to ascertain that a dolomite sand laid at the Manila Bay will bring no hazardous effect on human health and the environment. The tests aim to determine the sand's metal components such as iron, nickel, lead, and mercury. There was also grain size analysis to make sure no particles can be swept away by the wind. X-ray diffraction analysis to analyze the chemical composition of the dolomite and the pH and specific metals analysis done through toxicity characteristic leaching procedure to examine if the material is hazardous or not. According to studies, the lead content of the sample is only at 0.050 mg per liter while its mercury content is only at 0.0005 mg per liter. The quantities of other hazardous metals like selenium, arsenic, barium, cadmium, and chromium are also much lower compared to the limit set by the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. According to engineer William Cunado of the Environmental Management Bureau, this means that the dolomite in Manila Bay is not hazardous to humans and the environment. Cunado adds that the sample do not contain hazardous metals that may leach into the environment. Meanwhile, experts from the University of the Philippines Marine Science Institute believe that there is no shortcut in rehabilitating the environment and the dolomite dumped in Manila Bay will not help solve the problem. The experts added that the act is at most just a beautification attempt but one that is very costly and temporary. This is because the condition in the Manila Bay would mean that strong waves, especially during storms, will erode the dolomite. Though there is a breakwater in the Baywalk area, the water level and the waves during storms can penetrate the breakwater. 
Experts also add that acid rain which occurs in Metro Manila and the groundwater seeping in the Baywalk area can gradually dissolve the dolomite granules. Moving forward, the group suggests that to solve the problems in Manila Bay, establishing infrastructures like wastewater treatment plants are needed, as well as relocating informal settlers by the bay and connected rivers, and to make sure to have zero garbage input. Last September 19, Environment Secretary Roy Simato said that part of their Manila Bay Rehabilitation Program is relocating informal settlers, cleaning the rivers connecting to Manila Bay, and installing wastewater treatment facilities around Manila Bay. Vincent Arboleda, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Minors keep out of internet cafes as classes begin next week. Lea Ilagan tells us why. The Joint Task Force Coronavirus Shield Ground Commanders to coordinate with local governments on prohibiting minors inside internet cafes. JTF TV Shield Commander, Police Lieutenant General Guillermo Eliasar says that the police need to go visit internet shops, internet cafes that will be caught accepting minors inside their establishments will be face complaints from violating city ordinances and the IATF guidelines. The existing ordinances na gumagana sa particular locality uh, will be the basis para sila ay mapaila ng kaso. At the same time, i-recommend natin sa LGU para sarhan o tanggalan ng uh, permit to operate or business permit itong mga establishment na malalaman natin na may paglabag dito sa ating mga panuntunan. The UNTV News team visited some internet shops in Quezon City and Caloocan but they remain closed. So itong internet cafe na papayagan na depende sa palisan ng LGU na mag-operate, ay eh, iniisip natin na baka yung mga minors magpuntahan doon. So, dapat maliwanag sa lahat na isan po, mayroong mga LGUs na i-allow ang operasyon ng uh, internet cafe. Dapat liwanagin natin ha, na ang mga minor hindi pwede doon dahil bawal sila still lumabas. Meanwhile, the Taguig local government has launched a tele-aral center for the opening of classes on Monday, October 5. The tele-aral center is equipped with teachers who had undergone trainings, some led by call center supervisors. The center has 15 telephone lines for students to call, 20 additional substitute and support staff, and 50 desktop computers. This is to highlight both the quality of education and the importance of safety of teachers and students amid the pandemic. Leia Ilagan, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. The Education Department assures its readiness for school year 2020-2021, including printed modules. Dante Amento tells us why. Education officials will lead a ceremony on Monday, October 5, as school year 2020-2021 kicks off. DepEd will showcase its preparations for the class opening and continuous implementation of distance learning to include health and safety protocols. DepEd regional directors will be asked to give live updates in their respective areas. Based on DepEd's report, more than 667 million modules have been printed. As for online learning, close to 33,000 developed online materials and almost 3 million online modules are ready for the first quarter of school year. 162 radio stations and 207 television channels and stations will help DepEd for the radio-based and television instruction modality. More than 750,000 teachers and 12 million parents or guardians have undergone training for those distance modality. As of today, more than 24.7 million learners have enrolled for the coming school year. DepEd Secretary Leonor Briones says they cannot afford for another rescheduling of class opening because it will really affect the students' education. Sa gitna ng ating mga debate, sa gitna ng ating mga exchanges ng opinion sa ating mga sigawan, sa ating pagmurahan, dapat hindi natin kalimutan na ang bottom line, ang center ng lahat ng mga exertions natin, lahat na ginagawa natin sa edukasyon ay um, 
bata. Dan tiamen tu UN TV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Now here's a glimpse of what's the weather like in parts of the country. The southwest monsoon or hanging habagat is, is affecting part of the country. State Weather Bureau Pagasa says this will bring cloudy skies with scattered rain showers and thunderstorms over Calabarzon, Mimaropa, Bicol Region, Visayas, Zamboanga Peninsula, and northern Mindanao. Meanwhile, Metro Manila and the rest of the country will experience partly cloudy to cloudy skies with isolated rain showers due to the southwest monsoon or localized thunderstorms. Possible flash floods or landslides may occur during severe thunderstorms, though Tropical Cyclone Advisory is issued. The Interagency Task Force Against COVID-19 approves the provision of cash or food packs for children aged 6 to 23 months and nutritionally at risk pregnant women. This is through the Dietary Supplementation Program. This is part of the government's program to improve the health care of citizens and eliminate hunger aggravated by the pandemic. The U.S. Embassy in the Philippines warns that if applicants for jobs in the United States receive an email requesting payment in exchange for a job offer, it may be a scam. According to the U.S. Embassy in Manila, the embassies of the United States, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and United Kingdom have teamed up against visa fraud, which often includes false promises of employment. Even if a job offer is legitimate, you are not allowed to work in the United States unless you have a permanent resident card, an employment authorization document, or an employment-related visa. A reminder, without an approved petition, you will not be able to apply for an employment visa. For U.S. visa and other consular updates, visit the website of the U.S. Embassy in the Philippines. That's ph.usembassy.gov. Meanwhile, the National Bureau of Investigation filed several complaints this afternoon before the Office of the Ombudsman against former and current officials of the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation, or PhilHealth. Among those charged were former PhilHealth President and CEO Ricardo Morales, Arnel De Jesus, Renato Nimshako, Israel Francis Fargas, and five others. The complainants filed were the complaints filed rather were violations of the Anti Graft and Corrupt Practices Act, malversation of public funds and property, violation of the National Internal Revenue Code, and violation of certain provisions of Republic Act Number no. One Zero Five One. Just as Secretary Menardo Guevara says, more complaints will be filed in the coming days or weeks against errant PhilHealth personnel and their cohorts. The Philippine Health Insurance Corporation assures the public that it will cover costs for the swab test of senior citizens and those belonging to the vulnerable population. Vincent Arboleda will tell us why. The Department of Health Memorandum No. 2020-0258-A specifies individuals that are considered at risk for COVID-19. According to Ray Balenia, Senior Manager for the Corporate Communications Department of PhilHealth, this serves as the basis for COVID-19 testing package. Under this package, all individuals considered at risk for COVID-19 need not to worry about the cost of swab tests as PhilHealth will shoulder the expenses. These include senior citizens, the vulnerable population, as well as healthcare workers and frontliners. Even the poor need not worry about the swab test as long as they meet the qualifications such as experiencing COVID-19 symptoms and the relevant travel history or close contact to a COVID-19 positive individual. Halimbawa ay uh, inabot sa facility o hospital yung isang kababayan natin na hindi pa siya registered sa PhilHealth. Huwag po sila mag-aalala. Alam po ng mga facilities yung gagawin po nila. I-entertain po sila, magagamit nila yung serbisyo, at magagamit nila yung PhilHealth benefit. But individuals must undergo a swab test in PhilHealth accredited testing centers and hospital. As of August 31, there are 105 testing centers and hospitals accredited by PhilHealth. But the state health insurer also placed some limitations 
based on the guidelines by the Department of Health. May ilang mga types no, o mga at-risk individuals, meron silang pinaprescribe na number of tests at yung frequency. So yun lang din po ang susundin. Kapag ka pinaprescribe po yan ng Department of Health, ay uh, doon po kami nakasunod. Among these are people in the tourism industry where they can avail of the free swab test every four weeks. Meanwhile, those working in the manufacturing sector and economy workers are entitled to a free quarterly swab test. These include people working in the transportation sector, food and non-retail establishments, construction workers, market vendors, and even those in the mass media. But Filipinos who want to visit tourist sites cannot avail of the free swab test. Meanwhile, new PhilHealth chief Dante Giran says he is not in favor of the recommendation of some lawmakers to privatize PhilHealth. Giran says this may send a wrong signal that the people do not trust government officials. Lawmakers has also expressed to the Justice Department to include in their findings the liability of DOA Secretary Francisco Duque III. DOJ Undersecretary Adrian Sugay says they have not yet submitted formal complaints against officials involved in alleged irregularities in the agency. Sugay added that they are also looking into other fraud allegations such as the questionable IT equipment and possible collision of the private sector. Vincent Arboleda, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Australia expects an exceptionally large deficit in its upcoming budget. Meanwhile, one of the measures considered to be included in the upcoming federal budget is bringing forward a legislation on income tax cuts to boost household spending. Here's why from Marvi Delphin. Australia expects an exceptionally large deficit in the federal budget for 2020 to 2021 to be announced Tuesday next week. This is due to the unprecedented government spending induced by the COVID-19 pandemic. The spotlight will be fixated on the stimulus packages National Treasurer Josh Frydenberg is set to deliver to tackle the key issues needed to be addressed to kickstart Australia's economy. On July 23, the Commonwealth Treasury forecast a deficit of $184.5 billion for 2020 to 2021. Since then, the JobKeeper and JobSeeker programs have been extended and expanded to over $100 billion. In August, Stage 4 lockdown restrictions were imposed in Melbourne, crippling businesses and families. In response to the COVID-19 recession, which saw a rise in unemployment, Frydenberg is set to keep stimulus flowing until joblessness progresses towards full and stable employment levels by setting up a spending spree before the next election, due mid-year of 2022. Other measures considered to be included in the upcoming federal budget include bringing forward legislation on income tax cuts to boost household spending and the provision of business investment allowance tax breaks. Besides the investment in infrastructure and manufacturing to generate jobs, which was reported yesterday, a potential wage subsidy scheme is also underway for new hiring. This new wage subsidy scheme will succeed JobKeeper if it gets phased out. Financial experts say that the government will need to look more towards retraining and reskilling workers and redirecting capital if border closures persist beyond 2021. Since the strict closure of interstate and international borders, immigration activity have been severely impacted and thus causing a domino effect in the housing and construction industry as population growth rates continue to plummet. Experts add that Australia will continue to run below its potential until operation of service sectors normalize. Marvi Delphin, UN TV News and Rescue, Australia. We serve the people. We give glory to God. The coronavirus has breached the White House inner circle. James Buntuyan tells us why. U.S. President Donald Trump has said that he and First Lady Melania Trump have tested positive for coronavirus and are now in quarantine. The 74-year-old U.S. President has announced the news in a tweet. He wrote, We will get through this together. 
This comes after one of Mr. Trump's closest aides tested positive for coronavirus. Hope Hicks, a 31-year-old advisor to the president, was the closest aide to President Trump to test positive so far. She traveled with him on Air Force One to a TV debate in Ohio this week. Physician to the President Sean Conley has released a statement saying the President and the First Lady are both well at this time and they plan to remain home within the White House during their convalescence. Conley says he expects the President to continue carrying out his duties without disruption while recovering. The First Lady has said both she and the President are feeling good and have postponed all upcoming engagements. She advises everyone to stay safe. James Bontuyan, UNTV, News and Rescue, USA. We serve the people, we give glory to God. California becomes the first U.S. state to pass a law establishing a task force to study and make recommendations on reparations for Black Americans. The landmark legislation calls for the creation of a nine-member commission to inform Californians about slavery and explore ways the state might provide reparations, according to a statement from Governor Gavin Newsom's office. The bill was offered by Assemblymember Shirley Weber of San Diego, who introduced it to state legislators back in February. Newsom signed it into law on Wednesday. And before we close, we would like to greet members Church of God International a happy three-day special thanksgiving to God. And those are the reasons behind the news, October 2, 2020. I am Horlin Delgado. Reasons we deliver to you as they unfold. I'm Angelo Castro III. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. I am William Theo. We serve the people. We give glory to God.